So let's talk about Kamala. So Kamala's, uh, Kamala has obviously has had a lot of energy and a lot of momentum behind her from an electoral perspective, electoral perspective. And I think she's gotten a kind of a free ride from, from Trump, who has been unbelievably ineffective at criticizing her instead of criticizing policies and particularly thing. He'd rather complain about crowd sizes and about whether he won or lost the 2020 election. I mean, he's just running an awful campaign, a really, really bad campaign. So she's benefit from, benefited from all of that, and it's, it's taken her, I think, quite far, according to the polls. It's taken her into the lead in, in many of the swing states and uh, in, the, uh, in the popular vote. Now, again, you can only rely on polls so much. We've learned that many, many times, and uh, it's also very early. It's very early in terms of, um, in terms of what the polls actually, uh, actually mean. Um, but, but again, Trump is running a bad campaign, I think. And uh, I, I think pretty much everybody within the Republican Party thinks Trump is running a bad campaign. So it's not just me who doesn't like Trump, but it's also people who like Trump think he's being pretty bad. Uh, but Kamala's, adv Kamala's advantage up until now has been that uh, she doesn't have to stand for anything. She, she basically is the anti-Trump. Uh, she's young and energetic, uh, so she looks somewhat, I don't get it, but obviously looks somewhat charismatic. Uh, she is a continuation of kind of the Biden uh, presidency, which kind of for a lot of Democrats is, is reassuring and comforting that there's continuation and con con continuance from, from uh, uh, the Biden presidency. Uh, but she's also, you know, dabbled in kind of left-wing progressive politics and therefore has the appeal on, uh, on the very far left. And she doesn't really and hasn't articulate, articulated any real policy positions that are different than, uh, uh, that are different than Biden's or, or that are uniquely hers. There's no real yet, or there hasn't been at least until this weekend, until Friday, hasn't been any real programmatic positions that she's taken. This is what I'll do when I become president. And she's been very smart by basically not giving us any of those. Well, she did on Friday. And they were, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, they were so stupid that even a lot of Democrats were like taken aback. I mean, even, uh, even her, I think people who generally support her were like, what? So where do we start? Uh, basically, two main uh, economic proposals. So she gave this economic speech. This is her big thing, right? Uh, and, and the big thing, you know, starts off with, with basically, uh, you know, basically making a point um, that, let me just one sec. I am, I'm just checking something out here. All right, this is uh, give me a hard time. Basically focusing on two things, which are good, which are good things. She wants to increase opportunities and lower costs. And that's great, yeah. I mean, I, my economic plans and my economic ambitions, if I were in a, that, in a politi political position, was... Um, increase opportunities and lower costs. Now, I would also include something about freedom and, and so on, but, but the way to increase opportunity and lower costs is through, you guessed it, freedom. We'll, we'll get to some proposals around that uh, in a minute. But she proposed, uh, we'll talk about opportunities in a minute, but she proposed basically increase opportunities and lowering costs by using the worst types of government intervention uh, possible. The heart of what uh, she proposed is uh, basically to uh, prevent uh, grocery prices from rising. Uh, you know, we've, we've had inflation. Uh, everybody's felt that inflation, particularly people who, whose uh, grocery shopping is a big part of their consumption bas basket. 
um, they, they, they've really helped, they've really felt, uh, you know, the, the inflation. It's been, it's been uh, fairly high, right? So uh, she proposed, uh, well, she, she named the fault for this. So whose fault is uh, all, this, uh, all this inflation? Well, I mean, she came up with a, uh, she is proposing an ancient, a very, very ancient, uh, uh, you know, a, a causal uh, relationship between inflation and corporate greed. So she's basically decided that she is going to adopt Elizabeth Warren economics. She is basically going to adopt a left-wing populist economic agenda. Not that different than Trump's. We'll get to Trump later. But basically, blame the other, and in this case, the big other, the big evil other, the big evil other that, uh, when it comes to economics, we always blame. Let's blame economics. Let's blame corporations. Right? Let's blame big business. You know, the big supermarkets, the Costco's of the world. L let's blame Walmart groceries. Let's blame, you know, big corporations. Because uh, she argues that inflation is caused by price gouging. Now, there were a lot of problems with that argument. Um, first, it has a very long history. It, it really goes back to a suspicion of... Uh, business and, and profit-seeking, call it greed, but profit-seeking, it goes back to the Greeks. Both Plato and Aristotle, and Aristotle, had both were, were very suspicious when it came to merchants and the profits. Uh, merchants who were middlemen between producers and consumers, the profits they made, uh, something was off there. They, they didn't get the economic value of, uh, of merchants and uh, but you saw that uh, in, in a variety of different economic experiments during uh, Greek time. But maybe the most famous uh, example of, you know, blaming merchants and blaming, uh, blaming markets and blaming corporations, they weren't technically corporations back there, but blaming businesses, was Diocletian in uh, the very early 4th uh, uh, century AD, in I think 301. Uh, there was a lot of inflation in Rome. And the inflation was clearly, it was clear why the inflation was happening. This is a period where Rome is, is beginning its decline, and, and part of the manifestation of that decline is shrinking tax revenue. Shrinking uh, economic activity resulted in shrinking tax revenue just at a time when uh, they need a lot of money to protect the borders. I mean, uh, the barbarians were ever more powerful, ever more aggressive, ever more seeking to disrupt Rome and to take land from Rome. And, uh, you know, so what they started doing, what the Roman uh, treasury uh, started doing is debasing the coins. Uh, you know, silver coins had less silver in it. Uh, and uh, by, by debasing those coins and, and uh, you know, one way to think about inflation, because there's so much confusion about inflation, one way to think about inflation, I, I, I got this from the grumpy economist who often has um, simple, easy ways of describing things. It's the decline in the value of money. The decline in the value of money. That is that overall money is worth less. Now, what is the worth of money? The worth of money is measured in how much you can purchase for it. But, but also if, if the money was silver or the money was gold, uh, you know, a decline in the value of money would be generated by having less silver in a silver coin. You, you've got less value in the coin, so it's, it's worth less. And therefore, people realize this, and they're not willing to sell you as much for it as they did before when it was pure silver and its value was higher. Um, you know, in, in, in a, in, when you print more money, when there's a certain stock of money, and then you print more you make that stock of money worth less. You are devaluing the value of money. When you run deficits, 
when you run massive deficits that are unlikely to be paid back using kind of any normal means, uh, the market then expects you to inflate in the future, to devalue the currency in the future in order to be able to pay back with less valuable coin, less valuable paper money in this case. So they expect inflation in the future, which they already price in today. So all of these things are a lowering of the value of money, which manifests itself in a, a, a hit on the purchasing power of that money, which manifests itself in rising prices, rising wages, rising everything that is denominated in terms of the money, its cost rises. And that's what CPI and these other measures are trying to capture. They're trying to capture the overall rise in prices. Now, this is why I often tell you, I talk, we talk about uh, relative prices. When there's a supply shock, let's say from, for, for stuff coming in from China because of COVID or whatever, then stuff coming in from China's price might go up. But if the money is still the same money, if nothing has changed in terms of the quantity of money and, and the value of the money, then those prices will go up and other prices will come down or stay the same. But the general prices will not go up. You will not get this lowering of the value of money. You will not get a systemic rise in prices of costs. Um, and so supply shocks don't cause um, don't cause inflation. Let's say let's say that uh, greedy corporations manage to corner the market for tomatoes. And I mention tomatoes only because tomatoes in Spain are amazing. They're so much better than tomatoes in the United States, just, just as an aside. Um, but let's say they could corner the price of tomatoes or corner the price of chicken or corner the price of something, as Elizabeth Warren has accused corporations of doing. Let's say that were true. And the price of tomatoes just went way up. If nothing happened to the monetary base, if nothing happened to the quality of money, to the value of money, then people would buy fewer tomatoes and you know, they would buy more of other stuff and overall, you would have no inflation. Even if all grocery prices went up, if those went up for a while because of quote, greedy corporations, you still wouldn't have inflation because other things would, their price would go down. There's only so much money to be spent at any given point in time. So, you know, it's important to understand what inflation is, which clearly, clearly, uh, you know, Kamala and her economic advisors and the people who wrote this up have no clue what it is. It's also this, and by the way, one of the most, you know, where are the democratic economists? I mean, most economists are Democrats. Um, this idea that inflation is caused by price gouging, greed inflation, greedflation, as Elizabeth Warren has called it, it's not very popular among economists. I mean, really, no serious economist, with some exceptions, really believes this. Where are they? Where are all these economists speaking up? Now, some have. Noah Smith, to his credit, left of center economist, um, uh, has spoken up against this post gouging theory and was quite critical of Kamala um, after Friday. Uh, so, of others, uh, you know, there's a, I mean, what was amazing was a couple of stories in the, um, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, among, uh, a lot of stories coming out of Democrats just upset about this, but also I see I see an op-ed in the uh, in the Washington Post, Washington Post, very 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 critical of this, not by somebody I know to be a well-known Republican, although she might be, I don't know. Um, and then you get the uh, then then there's another Washington Post, there's an interview with some of the. Uh, opinion writers, the, the, some of the editorial staff at the Washington Post, and they are scathing about this idea that inflation is caused by cross-gouging. So I have no idea 
who came up with this idea. Uh, and I have no idea, you know, where it comes from. I mean, I know where it comes from. I have no idea uh, where all the economists are. I mean, the one economist that has actually supported this nonsense, and this is just shocking, is, uh, you know, is a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who is just, has become a joke. I mean, he used to be an economist. I mean, we all had real disagreements with him when he was an economist. But, it, but, but you know, he functioned within a certain space of economic theory, and he did economics, and he won a Nobel Prize for economics that he did. Again, we, we might not agree with the conclusions and his explanations for everything he did, but he has just become a Paul Krugman. He's become a hack. It comp he's, it's like he's lost like 50 IQ points or something. Complete nonsense, right? Um, this is him, I guess, last night or, or two nights ago. Um, Neoliberalism has given full reign to the growth of market power. Sectors of the economy where there is more market power uh, have had more inflation. We call it greedflation. First of all, there is no, first of all, that's complete nonsense. I mean, the areas that have had the highest rise in prices, not inflation, the highest increase in prices, and he should know better. Again, relative prices, he's talking about relative prices, some sectors, not all sectors. Inflation covers everything. But those sectors that have had the most increases in prices over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, if you had a one way to identify them, it's where there is incredible, where there is incredible market concentration, market concentration in government, education, healthcare. Those are the things, that, and housing. The things most regulated, more controlled by government have seen the highest increases. I mean, it really is sad to see I don't know. At least you have to respect somebody like Stiglitz. Okay, he used to be a professional. Again, a professional, not a very good professional, you could argue, but a professional. And, and then they become complete. I mean, even using the term neoliberalism, which he can't define, nobody can define. Um, what's he now against? Free trade? Is that what he's against? Again, a position that no economist would have taken 10 years ago. No real economist would have taken. I mean, Trump made it okay to, 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 to while against it, but I'm sure Stiglitz was opposed to the demonstrations uh, at the, World, at the uh, um, World Trade Organization in Seattle in 1999. I'm sure he supported the World Trade Organization back then when he was an economist. No more. The guy's a complete and utter hack. Um, anyway, where were we? Uh, how, you know, I was talking about Diocletius, right? Anyway, Diocletius, they, 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 they reduced the value of a coin, which created inflation. Diocletius blamed this not on the devaluing of the coin. He blamed it on corporate greed. He blamed it on the greed of businessmen. So Diocletius actually had, uh, he s created a bureaucracy within uh, the Roman Empire that actually set price controls limited the ability of increasing prices. And, and literally, you, you can find these records, and, and we have them, records of how much traders were allowed to charge for wheat and barley and rye and millet and, and, and how much, you know, they were allowed to charge for attic wine and I don't know what must, boiled down must. Somebody knows what m must is. And then spiced wine and Wine with wormwood. That sounds really good. I mean, that, we need to try sometime at one of the fancy restaurants here. Wine with wormwood. I, I, you know, rose wine, pork, beef, goat meat or mutton, pork sausage, beef sausage, hen peasants, chicken, cabbage sprouts. And then, of course, there were also price controls on labor because it was, inflation was everywhere. So there were price controls on farm labor, on stonemasonry, on cabinet maker, on carpenter. Um, and he basically created a massive economic bureaucracy to deal with all of this. And, <laughs> you know, of course, it was uh, an unmitigated disaster. Prices did not go down. It had 
uh, no impact on inflation because the coin was debased. You know, Nixon tried this, just, just to see so you clear that this is a bipartisan temptation to, uh, in the early 1970s when inflation was out of control, uh, not only did in the White House everybody wore a pen that said whip inflation now, even Alan Greenspan, uh, go figure, uh, wore that pen, but, uh, you know, Nixon imposed price controls which blew up in his face, a complete disaster. Prices are a monetary phenomenon in the sense that, inf sorry, inflation is a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it, is a, it represents a debasement of the currency, a debasement of money. And <laughs> all right, I, I'm told that must is what comes out of the fermentation of grapes, which then turns into wine. Ah, so this is, so they were actually setting price controls, not just on final goods, but they were setting price controls on intermediary product. I mean, it just shows you, I mean, the sophistication of the, of the Roman Empire, that they could enforce such a thing, not just final merchant prices, but even prices for, 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 you know, in the supply chain. Pretty amazing. Anyway, it was a complete disaster for that collision. Uh, and uh, only helped create the economic turmoil that ultimately, uh, you know, ultimately led to, to the complete destruction of the Roman Empire, or complete demise of the Roman Empire and demise of, um, of the economy of Europe. Right. This is one more, not the determining step, but one of the economic steps that led towards that complete uh, demise. So basically what, um, you know, what Harris, what, uh, what everybody's been saying about Harris is, is she's proposing, um, what Harris is proposing is two, in cases, oh, okay, one, one more thing to say before I get to this. So one of the things to note is that inflation in grocery products has been about one point something percent for the last eight months. So it peaked in 2022, and it's been going down since then. What's driving inflation right now in our economy is not, not grocery prices. So she's fighting, a re but she's fighting something that the American people feel, feel, emphasis, feel, like is a real issue and a real problem and needs to be addressed. So she's fighting a, a real battle, but she's fighting one that she thinks will appeal to voters because they feel like they're under these, uh, this, this real constraint. Anyway, uh, price controls have never worked throughout history, never worked. Uh, but so she is not proposing price controls exactly. She is proposing to allow the FTC and the SEC to be able to uh, first of all, identify when price gouging is happening, when companies are raising prices. I don't know, how do you define price gouging? High. They're raising prices high. They're raising prices higher than some government bureaucrat thinks is appropriate. That's what price gouging is. In those cases, when uh, a group of bureaucrats at the FTC or the SEC, entities that just don't have enough power, we know that, when a group of bureaucrats at the FTC or the SEC feel like price is out of control, they will have the power then to go after the businesses that control that product, that are raising the prices. It will give them now a new tool. They have the antitrust tool. Now they will have this new tool. Um, to go after them for excessive prices that are unrelated to the cost of doing business. Now, I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a rabbit hole because what are the costs? Uh, and and uh, a lot of economists disagree on what costs should be included and what not. I mean, not very good economists, but again, they're going to disagree. Uh, is, for example, a big one is, is the cost of capital included? Should you count the cost of capital, which is often, uh, you know, contingent on interest rates? Um, is profit okay? Should you have profit? Uh, 
you know, what about making money during some periods, making maybe more than usual some periods in order to offset the fact that there are other periods where you lose money? Oil industry is famous for this. Who gets to decide? How do they determine? So she's not, and then in that case, what they have, will have the power to do is cap the price. Can't go over this price. Again, why is she doing this? Now, here is, here is, I think, the interesting aspect of this. I don't actually think this has anything to do with inflation. I think this serves two purposes for Harris. One is it presents it to the American people, to, the, to swing voters, as somebody who takes their plight seriously and wants to do something about it. And the reality is in America today that 99% of the American population are basically worse than ignorant about economics. And I say worse than ignorant because it's not, if you're ignorant, you don't know anything. But they think they know economics, but what they think they know is all wrong. All wrong. So she appeals to them by saying, I'm going to do something. And I'm going to, I'm going to go after those corporations. And everybody like, loves blaming corporations. This is the same tactic as Trump used. We need an other to blame for our problems. Now, we could say, you know, it's the Fed's fault. They printed too much money. We could say, yeah, it was COVID, but that makes the government look weak. So that's not a good other, particularly not when you were just in power. So the best other to blame inflation on is, you can't really do it to Chinese. You can't, you can't blame immigrants in this case. You, you can't blame elites. You can't blame Chinese. So you blame corporations. So this isn't an other Republicans like to use, although Trump comes close often comes close, but it's one Democrats love to use. And it's one that a lot of working class Americans sympathize with. So a big part of what she's trying to do here is basically to engage with the anti-business, anti-corporation, anti-profit, anti-big business, not, not small business, we love small business, big business, anti-big business sentiment that exists within the American population. And but, you know, from an electoral perspective, it could very well work. It is, it is very, potentially very, very powerful. So that's, that's the first thing she's trying to do. But really the second, and this is the scary part, and this is the, I mean, the first part is scary too, that people are this ignorant. I mean, again, price controls is really economics 101. Everybody knows. But here's the scary part, the scarier part. I think she's doing this because this is, this is the Democrats' wet dream. The Democrats' wet dream is not about price gouging. It's not about inflation. It's, it's about centralizing economic power. It's about allowing bureaucrats and government officials and people in power to control our economy and to control it at the, at the, at the level of minutia. It's about empowering, empowering the exact opposite of what the Supreme Court is trying to do. It's about empowering the, you know, the, 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 the FTC and the SEC and the many, many alphabet agencies, soup agencies, alphabet soup agencies, something like that, that we have to have more control over this crazy wild west of corporate capitalism we have in America today. I, I'm, I'm kidding. We have no capitalism in America today, but that's how they perceive it. They want to unleash the FTC to prosecute companies. This is, this is to give Lena Khan even more power than she already has in her antitrust division. This is to now expand them beyond antitrust. Oh, that's just one tool. This is to give them multiple tools to put them in the position of power over American businesses. This is about going after business, going after corporations, going after so-called greed, going after 
successful business. This is all about that envy driven, but really it's about power. Right? So it's not a policy battle about inflation. I mean, they know basically inflation might be more stubborn than the Biden administration would like, but inflation is not, particularly at the levels it's at right now, is not being driven by corporate greed. They know this. But they see this as an opportunity for a power grab. They see this as an opportunity to increase the power of the government vis-a-vis -vis corporate America. Right? This is a way to, to, to control, to take more, more control, to take more power. They have no interest in actually dealing with inflation, which would mean cutting government spending or at least closing the deficit in some way. Um, they have no interest in stopping the massive spending. Creating a scapegoat for all of that allows them to continue to do all the stuff that they are doing. It allows them to spend like crazy, to continue deficit spending, and blame corporate America, and then go screw corporate America at the same time. So, no, I mean, the real issue here is, is power, control, central planning. That's what it's all about. And, and seen from that perspective, uh, this is really, really, really scary stuff. This is a massive growth in government. And it reflects, either it reflects unbelievable economic ignorance or a massive power grab. Now, let me tell you what the good news is. Uh, 